and I'm introducing today David Tickison, who's the Associate Dean of Library Services at Cal State Fresno. I'm truly honored to introduce David. I've known David for a long time, and he's been a reference librarian for over 25 years. Um, in 2005, David won the Isidore Gilbert Mudge Award for the Distinguished Contribution in Reference Librarianship. And he built on that success by um, being elected to the president of RUSA from 2007 and 8. And RUSA is a division of ALA. <coughs> David holds a bachelor's and master's degree in library science from the University of Illinois at Urbana. And he's worked at a number of uh, very large libraries, SUNY Albany, Iowa State, and Miami. So we welcome David today. And uh, as part of this webinar, you'll be able to ask a question online. And David will wait and um, take those in the middle or at the end of the session. If he doesn't get through all of them, he, um, when you get the actual um, uh, webinar results, they will be answered within that document. So without further ado, um, let's hear from David. Thank you. OK, and, uh, this is Dave. And can you hear me, those who are able to talk, as in Ellen? And I'm going to start my slideshow. And OK, is my screen on your screen? And yes. I'm assuming that it is. OK, thank you. It's, a, it's a, actually an honor to be asked to do this. Um, uh, reference work, I full disclosure, have to say it's been now been over 30 years that I've been a reference librarian, as I'm, I get older and grayer, um, and have been involved with reference collections since the very beginning, back in the 78, and have seen reference collections evolve from print only in the 70s to electronic based today. And this program is going to talk about how reference collections became what they were and what I see them becoming today. And as Ellen said, if you have questions, type them into your question box. And I've got a couple of preset spots during this presentation when I'll see what questions there are and see if I can answer them. So this is the rise and fall of reference collections. And we're sponsored by Alex. And I'm very happy that Alex is uh, doing this series of webinars. And it, it's a great way to reach out to its members. And I commend the Alex officers for doing that. And I pr welcome all of you who are participating, including people from Iowa State University. I have to do a shout out there, because a lot of my knowledge of reference comes from having worked at Iowa State in the 80s. I also want to welcome all of our Canadian uh, participants today. We have people in Newfoundland and Ontario. And in fact, during this webinar, we have people diagonally across the North American continent, continent from Newfoundland all the way to San Diego and from Washington State to the south. So welcome to everybody. And hopefully this will be informative. So let's, let's jump right in. And my first question for, for all of you is, which came from first, reference books or reference librarians? And on the side, you'll see a poll uh, button. And what you want to do is select the which came first poll and submit your answer. So I'll give everybody a chance to do that. And we'll see what the results are. So whichever you think came first, reference books, reference librarians. OK. And And 
the results that I see show that nobody voted, which means something I did not do something right here. Is that is that what you are seeing as well? Dave, this is Carrie on the back end. Yeah. I think uh, we ended up closing the poll accidentally. Okay. So well, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Let, let's just, I'll give you the answer. There'll be another poll later on, and hopefully I'll get that part right. But here's the answer. Reference books predate reference librarians, and in fact predate reference service. And when I talk about the rise of reference collections, I think it's very important that we know the history of where reference came from. And so reference books really started 250 years ago, a long time. And the first reference books, or, or the oldest can still published reference book, is the Encyclopedia Britannica. And throughout today's talk, I'm going to use the Britannica as an example, because I think they are a model of what reference resources strive to be. And so I'm going to give them a lot of credit for their innovation, but I'm also going to give them a lot of criticism for how that innovation may or may not have held up. So this is a, a picture of the first Britannica. And it was published in series form between 1768 and 1771. It was an idea to, they, they published it in, in little folios that later they could bind and make a set out of. And the idea was they needed the subscription money to pay for the cost of compiling the encyclopedia. Uh, many of you have this in your collections because it is in fact, uh, in, it is in fact available from Britannica. You can buy a reproduction, which is what my library has, all these pictures of the reproduction, not the original. And it was inspired by this work, which I must say is the first reference book, the Encyclopedia of, or a Universal Dictionary, etc. Titles in those days, if you look from Encyclopedia to right before the author's name, that's the title. Titles were, were as long as books back then. And I was delighted to find out my library actually has a copy of this. We have, as you can see, the sixth edition. But the first edition was in the 1720s. And reference librarians didn't come out until 100 years after the first reference books, so at least 100 years after the first uh, Britannica. And this is a picture of some the library at Fresno State here from about 1912. Um, it, and other libraries, that's when our campus was founded, so there was no library before that. But uh, libraries have evolved considerably during that time period. Uh, the reference books. We expect certain things out of reference books. And I've made a list here just off the top of my head. The reference, we expect reference books to be authoritative. Now, you know, we expect them to be written by people who know what this, they're talking about in that subject. We expect them to be factual and accurate, uh, at least as of the time that the books come out. And when I, I'm saying reference books at this point, but I'm really generalizing this to reference sources, whether it's print or electronic or some other form, we, the, this is our expectation of what we want from our reference materials. Reference materials are not meant to be read cover to cover. There's a famous story in the Arthur Conan, Do Arthur Conan Doyle Sherlock Holmes called the Red-Headed League, which when I think of Britannica, I, have, I always think of the Red-Headed League. And in that story, the, the main character that's not Holmes and Watson was asked, was hired to copy the Britannica, starting with the A's. And so he would go every day to this office and sit and write down the Britannica. And um, you know, if you haven't read the story, it's one of my favorite Holmes stories. But uh, he goes and reads the Britannica, and it starts with the A's. That'll be significant in a moment. But he's probably the only person who sat and read the Britannica, starting with the A's and going on and through the alphabet. Everyone else, in reference, what we're looking for is short, factual, summarized information. And so we use the index or the website or 
the links, whatever, to find the specific piece that's really what we want to answer the query that we have on hand. So the reference books are really designed for quick lookup, short information, as opposed to a novel which you read in its entirety front to back. Now the properties of reference collections have evolved to sort of become what I've listed here. Generally they're non-circulating. And the reason that reference books are non-circulating is that we want them to be available to our users when they need them. And if the Britannica is not on the shelf, nobody could use the Britannica. This is the model of reference that goes back to the beginning. And in fact, it's the concept of circulation of books that I contend separated reference books from the rest of the collection. It wasn't really until the 1850s, Boston Public Library was really the first that I'm aware of that had a circulating collection in 1854. And it was a whole new concept. You mean I could take the book home with me if I have a card for the library? In the previous era, you read the books in the library. And so Boston Public was revolutionary. I think it's one of the biggest steps forward in access to information that our profession has done. It occurred 150 years ago. But once books started to circulate, librarians realized there's a few books we don't want to circulate because we need them here so that they can be available for our users. And that was the status of reference for most of its history. And then we, we, dis we reference librarians are smart people, decided, hey, we need to put the reference librarian near the reference books. And so generally, you have a reference desk or service point and surrounded by a reference collection. And that information is generally not available elsewhere. Reference books tend to be expensive. And I didn't put that on this list. But reference books tend to be more expensive than other books. And the information that they contain is generally information that you don't get from reading a novel or a nonfiction book. And so we wanted them by the people who can help the users. And uh, so we built reference collections and service points. And generally, the reference, every library has a different reference collection. Well, there's a large overlap. I suspect the majority of the people listening today do, in fact, have a copy of the Britannica in their collection. Um, every collection is different because it's all been selected by us to meet the needs of our users. So when I talk about the reference collection, while there's lots of similarities, there are also unique pieces of information. In fact, there's one source that every reference collection has that's different in every reference collection and that um, is probably one of the higher use items in every reference collection, and that's the local phone book. You know, you don't want the Fresno phone book in your collection, and I don't need your phone book in my collection, but for each of us, that work is something that gets a lot of use it actually happens to be available for free, which is amazing, and that's tailored to meet the needs of our, each of our own communities. Well, enough about, about what reference collections are like, because I suspect if you're listening to this, you know what reference collections are like. I want to kind of go over sort of an evolution of reference, and I'm going to use the Britannica because it's been around that long. The original concept, by the way, of the encyclopedia was a very daring concept. It, was, it came about through the era, Age of Enlightenment. Diderot in France actually predated anyone in uh, England, in the English-speaking world. To, we want, the concept was, we'll create a book, and the book even at that time was multiple volumes, that will contain all the information in the world so that we can go to one place and find about our world. And that's what encyclopedia strive to be. Now this is a picture, of, again, as a reproduction of that first Britannica. And if you look carefully, you'll notice something really interesting. That the guy in the red-headed league, if he got through the A's, he did a lot better than if he read the end of the alphabet. And if you look at the picture, you'll see volume one is A and B. Volume two is C through L. And volume three is M through Z. And it's not because almost every th one third of the information in the world in the English language starts with A and B. 
it's because Britannica couldn't pull off what they wanted to do. So the subscription service started really great. Wow, I got all this information on A's and B's. As they got several years into the project, they realized, like many projects, we don't have enough money to finish it. So they cranked out what they had, sent it to the subscribers, and fortunately it was good enough that they were able to make enough money to continue the project where they could have subsequent additions. But I think if any resource comes out today that's skewed, I don't even know what you call this, alphabetically skewed in this manner, it would be just ripped apart by any reviewers. By, and so in 1771, this was it. And it was really good, although flawed. By 1910, Britannica really did achieve its goal of summarizing the world of its time. And the 1910, uh, the 11th edition of the Britannica is still revered today as the definitive encyclopedia. And it, as you can see, I, can't, I couldn't photograph all the volumes. Uh, this is, out of my, again, out of my reference collection. We keep this in our reference collection, even today, and I suspect many of you do. Um, couldn't photograph all the volumes, but you could see that the distribution of knowledge represents the distribution of the alphabet much better. And it really did summarize and capture the world of the early, of the turn of the 20th century. The problem is that four years after this uh, encyclopedia came out, that entire world changed. When World War I began, the world that this encyclopedia described became radically different. And while Britannica was able to, in fact, capture the world for a year or two, it, it just couldn't, it, it didn't sustain itself. By 1974, I mean, they kept coming out with more editions. 1974, Mortimer J. Adler, who became the editor, had this brilliant idea. And it really, again, another revolutionary concept by Britannica that knowledge is not discrete facts, but it's all interrelated to each other. And so came up with the circle of knowledge. And if you want to go look at this, go grab your, they called it the new Encyclopedia Britannica. And in fact, LC gave it a new title. But to me, it's all Britannica. It's just an evolution of the old ones. But the, the concept that knowledge is inherently linked together, so something in science might be related to something in music, might be related to something in literature, really is an innovative concept. And I would contend that this 74, the new Britannica, really predated the web in terms of bringing information together. So if you could use this the way we use the World Wide Web today, it would be a remarkable information tool. And in fact, it was designed to be that way. There was one volume called the Propedia, which was the outline of knowledge. And you could see how all the different disciplines interact. There was a short set, 12 volumes, of ready reference. And this is the kind of thing we th tend to think of as reference books, where you look up factual information in discrete segments. And I love the fact they actually called it ready reference on the spine. And then there was the 16, 17 volume Macropedia, which was the knowledge in depth, which had lengthy articles on the world, on concepts like you know, World War I has an enormous article in there, the history of the United States, the history of England, the history of China. All the kind of things we'd want in more depth in an encyclopedia were in the Macropedia. Now, I failed to do something when I took this picture. You'll notice the last two volumes that are, have the blue say index. When the 74 encyclopedia came out, it had no index. And that was the biggest flaw that we librarians gave it, is that we could no longer look up the quick fact stuff. We had to go through this cycle. Well, the cycle was great for learning, but it wasn't great for answering people's questions. So those of us who were practicing reference librarians at the time just tended to leave Britannica on the shelf, and we went to World Book instead. By 94, Britannica had entered the electronic world. And 94 was the first CD-ROM Britannica. You can see by the picture it's still being published in CD-ROM today. Uh, Britannica, I have read an article, and I want to find out more about this, because I just read this a few weeks ago 
in a totally unrelated space about that uh, Microsoft actually approached Britannica about being the backbone of Encarta. I've never heard that before, but I do know that they used Funk and Wagnalls, which was probably the worst encyclopedia of its time for Encarta. But Britannica got, all, got into the CD-ROM environment and electronic environment a little bit after some others, but they did that. The problem with this, of course, is that in 92, the World Wide Web was invented. And by 94, it was becoming a phenomenon. And we could get information off the web. So we didn't really want to load and read and search a CD-ROM encyclopedia. Of course, Britannica also got online. They realized this very quickly. And in 1999, Britannica announced, in, with great fanfare, that it was going to be free, a free source on the web. There will never be another print edition. And that it will be a portal to the world of information, very much the same way that Britannica wanted to be. That first Britannica was supposed to summarize the world. Well, it took them two years to figure out that this is not, it, while it's a good intellectual model, it's not a good business model. And they were losing their shirts again. So they now have, you can buy a print edition. In fact, the one you've seen in these pictures is newer than 99. And you can also subscribe to Britannica online. Just within the last month, they've announced Britannica Mobile. And for $25 from the iTunes store, you can get the Britannica app. It's not the full Britannica. It's a, it's a uh, concise, and I don't know exactly what concise means. But here's the, this is off their advertising, the picture. It shows baseball and a number of articles related to baseball. And you could do all this on your iPhone. So Britannica really has kept up with changes in the reference environment. What's happened is that Britannica is not the only reference book in the world. And over the 200 years, there were more encyclopedias. There were more different types of things, directories, statistical summaries. Uh, abstracts, histories, chronologies, biographies, all of the reference types of things that we know. And reference became more and more specialized. Originally, there was the Britannica. That was your encyclopedia. Then somebody had the idea, well, we need encyclopedias in different subjects. So you have a science one. The McGraw-Hill Encyclopedia of Science and Technology is still the best general science encyclopedia. Then we need an encyclopedia in each field of science. So you get the Kirk Othmer Encyclopedia of, of Chemistry. And that's not exactly the title, but Kirk Othmer, for all anyone in sciences, knows that. is a very detailed encyclopedia in, in chemistry. But even that was not focused enough. So you get these sets in organic chemistry, organic chemistry, that are sort of treatises on those fields. And then again, even that wasn't always focused enough. So there's, an, there's one for organometallic chemistry. So re what happened is reference became a publisher's uh, joy because they could sell this type of information. It was, uh, they could sell, they could find different areas that didn't have good reference books and publish in it. And so what happened is over time, reference collections grew. And these are all pictures from my collection. It got bigger and bigger and bigger. And what's happened at the turn of the 21st century is we have huge reference rooms full of materials. And reference books really became what I call the royalty of library collections. They were these non-circulating, had prime space right next to the service points. They were the materials that we all revered. Oh, no, you can't take that out. It's a reference book. And with reference, you know, be careful with that. It's a reference book. So while we I jest about that, and in fact, really did reach an elevated thing. If you were, were the reference book, you are the prime resource for that subject discipline. Now I want to look at the questions. Do we have any? <laughs> um, and can I, I see them? OK. From we have a bunch of questions. And I'm trying to figure out how I can see more of them. Can you please speak up? OK, I hold up. Sorry about that. Um, is there any way to increase the volume? I, it's already at max. Am I being too soft? Sorry, I'm being too soft. Let me see if I can just speak louder. 
Um, we the poll didn't work. Okay, I got that. I'm. St And as somebody asked, some libraries circulate encyclopedias, but they're older editions. I'm going to get into the whole circulation thing in the next segment, so I'm going to hold off on answer. Don't some libraries circulate older encyclopedias? Yes. Uh, a model that we have used is that we often have the current edition in reference, non-circulating, and an older or perhaps several older editions in the stacks to circulate. That was a good way to get extra life out of a reference source that we purchased. Even after it lost its prime space, it was a little bit out of date for reference. Most of these tools are still good because for historical purposes, they, are, they have a lot of good information. So we had, um, we had the current one in reference and the older ones in the stacks. And you, libraries did all sorts of buying things. Uh, uh, many of us did a five-year rotation. We bought a different encyclopedia every year. So you'd buy Americana, World Book, Britannica, Funk and Wagnalls, Compton's, a children's encyclopedia, whatever your list was. And then when, when it got around to that title again, we could move the old one to the stacks. Will we have access to the PowerPoint? Yes. And somebody says it's OK now. I assume that means the volume. Those are all the questions that I see. Am I missing any other uh, staff on this? OK, good. That's all the questions. Let me go back to the next segment of the uh, PowerPoint. OK, now what's happened with reference collections? We we have these, these prime resources, prime location. Well, in the 200 years since Britannica's first edition, the obvious thing that's come about is technology. Um, and that all really has come about in the last 40 years. And it started with online. And when I say online, I'm talking about BRS, Dialog, SDC, those, these services that m many of you younger participants today would would really laugh about where we would actually call up the dialogue phone number, plug the phone into an acoustic coupler. Um, and I, I can't see you, but I suspect many of you people of my era are nodding your heads right now in memory of this. You paid per minute of access, and you got these databases like ERIC or PsychInfo or Medline. And that's how you got to electronic resources. Well, those electronic resources at the time were the hot stuff in our discipline. And um, that's how, were the only place you could do the sophisticated searching. It was really a tremendous step forward. It got even better when CD-ROMs came along, where you could just buy the thing. And I have a picture of Encarta here. Um, you could just buy it and load it. And I put Encarta in specifically because it is probably the most widely held electronic encyclopedia or electronic resource in the pre-web days because Microsoft is a very good marketer. And even though they used a horrible encyclopedia as the basis of Encarta, when they picked Funk and Wagnalls, it was the cheapest, the worst, the, the the least useful encyclopedia in the print world, it suddenly became the one everyone used because it came free with your new computer or it was a very low cost to buy a copy of it. So people had this all over the place. And then, of course, the Internet came along and people have access to everything. And Wikipedia is now the, the source that really most people turn to first. And uh, I'll get more talk a little bit more about Wikipedia in a little bit here. I think an equally important factor that affected reference collection use, in, in addition to technology and in some ways coupled with it, is home access. In the post-war and post-World War II era, we had encyclopedia door-to-door -door encyclopedia sales. People in the new prosperity in North America, and I don't know for sure in Canada, but I'm guessing that it was the same situation there, that the new, new prosperity 
brought families. They wanted their kids to have access to information. So people bought encyclopedias to use in the home. The prices, while still high, were not as high as compared to the average homeowner's income as they were in the earlier era. So people could afford to do this. And so many of us grew up with a world book or a Britannica or a child craft, which was the children's world book, in our homes. In my generation, we had a child craft. And that allowed people to have access to information that formerly was only in the library. Now they could just get it in their living room or their bedroom. We also had remote access to library information. And the key beginning to that was the telephone. People could, could call the library and get an answer. Public libraries set up these enormous telephone reference services. And Queens and, uh, and Brooklyn and New York were outstanding. You could call them, and they'd answer all sorts of things for you. So you didn't have to have go to the library to use the library's resource. Sort of parallel to that, we began to have remote access to information not even related to the library. You, there are various hotlines, information lines. Companies would set up consumer lines. Associations would set up, uh, set up help lines for people like the American Medical Association. You could call and ask a question. That just as of today, they're not going to diagnose your illness, but you could get information about what, what is diabetes, what, what are the treatments. You wouldn't have to go to the library for that. And that became blown everywhere when the World Wide Web took over, whereas every person with a connection to the web now has access to all this information that's on the web, most of which never would have been in a library in the first place, by the way, um, and probably doesn't deserve to be in a library. But the web gives people access outside of a library to information in the library and all the rest of the world's information. And I would contend that it's the access more than the technology that has changed what reference collections have become. And what's, what it's done is people aren't using reference books. And then here, I'm, when I say books, I mean print materials. They're using electronic resources, either ones the library pays for and they can get into, or ones they can get to through the web. There's been a decline in the use of published sources. What we, the traditional reference books published by uh, Macmillan and Gale and all those other reference publishers have gone down because non-published sources, primarily on the web, are so easily available that people don't have to go to the published sources. And we've seen this in our reference statistics. You know, there's been a talk for 20 years about reference statistics are going down. That's a whole different talk for me because I, I believe it, but I believe it because we do not count the right things and that actually while the numbers we're reporting are lower, if I ask any reference librarian I know, they'll always tell me, we're busier than ever. And yet the numbers are down. And it's because we don't count what's meaningful. As I say, that's a whole different talk. But people don't come to us for ready reference things anymore, those short factual statistics or facts or dates, because they can get that themselves. We have given the world the best tool for finding information that's been available in human history with the Internet. They don't, people need, don't need to ask us what date such and such happened. But what they do come to us for is much more complex. They want to find quality information. They want to find reliable information. They want to find information they can trust. And that's what used to be in reference books. And on the web, you can't tell if it's good or not in many cases. And so using our critical thinking skills, we really help our users find quality information. And that's the nature of the change in reference service, from finding factual information, which even 20 years ago, when I was at Iowa State, for you Iowa State people there, that was maybe 5% of the questions were, I need to know the number of this, or I need to know the date, or the address, or the phone number. There, were, there really weren't that many back then. But now that's gone to almost none of our questions, because that information is available to the consumer anywhere they are at any time.
Now they want to know more complex things. And that's what reference people are dealing with. So I have another poll. And I'd like to know if my interpretation of this is the same as yours. So if we can open the poll, and I'm going to launch it. And I believe I have launched it. Polling should be in progress. You, I would like you to say, in your experience, how has the what's happened in your library? I suspect you know, as, as the use of reference collection gone up, down, or stayed the same. And everybody's going to have an opinion on that because there's only three possibilities. And I'm, we're getting a fair number of people voting, which is good. And I, this is actually working this time. Thank you. Um, and I'll give it 10 more seconds, maybe, so that we're now over 90% of the people who are on, on the um, webinar have already voted. So it's, the numbers are stopping. I'll give you five more seconds. OK, poll is closed. Now, if I hit share. Can you see the poll results? OK, I'm, this, this makes me feel good, if nothing else, that, I, that your interpretations of what's going on are the same as mine. 94% of the people who voted said that the use of your collection has gone down. And I'm not at all surprised for the, some of the reasons I've given you. 5% say it's the same. 2% have said it's increased. And that's interesting. I'd like to hear, if, if you could, in the type into the question point when we get to the next questions. I'd like to know if you have an idea why it might have gone up. Because I'm, I'm in a situation where I'm in a brand new library, new building. The user traffic gate count is gone through the roof. We had over a million people in our first year. Yet use of reference is still low. So for those of you who've increased, I say, please type something in so we can discuss that in a little bit. OK, now if I go back, I believe I'm back to the PowerPoint. And I want to make sure that you are as well. So if you, hopefully you see the use of, I'm going to do the, give you the data from the use study that I did. This is my reference collection, Fresno State. Um, it is. A study of 2009, January through December. Again, for full disclosure, I, I stopped at December 17th, so it missed three days that we were open in December the following week when there wasn't a whole lot of traffic. But the data goes from January 1st to December 17th, 2009, in a brand new library, um, which would, in most cases, generate higher use. And we did this by all of our collection is RFID tagged. So it's very easy for us to do a count use. Everything that gets picked up gets counted before it's reshelved. Yes, people do shelve things themselves, reshelve themselves. Those would not be included. However, if somebody pulls a book off the shelf and just sets it down, that does get counted. So it sort of balances itself out. Everything is collected through the circulation system. If something was checked out, that data was collected through the check back in. As I said, data is from 2009. So here's the aggregate results. There are 31,058 items as of December 17th of 2009 in my reference collection. And many of you are saying, man, that's a big collection. And yes, it is. It's too big. Uh, one reason it is as big as it is is that includes all of the old print indexes and abstract volumes, including a almost complete run of the chemical abstracts, which is probably 6,000 of those volumes just in a, and of itself, which uh, is not shelved with the rest of the collection, by the way. It's shelved down in the lower level with, in an alcove off the main stacks because use is low. But I just haven't gotten up the courage to discard those yet. We discarded lots of old indexes, um, but we still have a number, many of which complement 
the newer part which is online and the, we have the old part that isn't online that we have in print and doesn't get much use but of 31,000 items and that's pieces 7,789 got used and you know that looks pretty good 25 percent of the collection got used last year well it, that's not really true if we look at the titles and this collapses, all of chem abstracts counts as one, all of dissertation abstracts counts as one, all of Britannica counts as one. There are 2,671 titles that had at least one use. Still not bad, 23% of the collection. But that's not really that great either. Because of the 31,000 unique items, this is pieces, only 3,478 ever got used in a year. And this, remember, this is either checked out or used in-house. So only 11% of the items have, were ever touched by anybody. But because they're in reference, we expect that they're going to be higher use. Or conversely, if, if they were only used once, somebody, just like any book in the stacks could have checked it out and taken it home. So of, of based on titles of 11,394 titles used five times or more, if we define high use as five times, only 400 of those titles were used five or more times, and that's 3.6%. That's not very good. If we define high use as 10 or more uses per, per year, which actually is less, still less than once a month, and since our circulation period for regular stack books for undergraduates is a month, that means these could have been checked out ten times. Only one percent of the collection of the titles were used ten or more times. If we go back to the items, it's even worse. Now, titles actually, I think, is a better representation because Britannica is one title. Somebody might use the A volume and the Z volume, and that's using the same title, but in terms of the actual volumes, you can see 1% five or more times and 0.4% were used 10 or more times, which is pretty pitiful, to be honest, in, in, in my humble opinion. And what got used? Well, here's the list of the top. I was going to do the top 10, but 9 through 12 was a tie, so I list all four of those. And you'll notice because we keep the opposing viewpoints, what we, we have a, what we call a hot topics section of reference, which has opposing viewpoints and the ad issue, and you can see some of those on here. So um, those get used a lot because student, undergraduate students writing papers, and you can tell just by this list what the number one subject for undergraduate papers is. It's global warming because we have four different global warming books in the top 10 or top 12 use in our collection. And so it's kind of interesting to see what actually got used. The, the, the number two, the dissertation abstracts, we have that online. Uh, we, we only recently got that, so for part of last year it wasn't online. But that is the thing that has given more disappointment to our users than any other book in the reference collection because the reason it gets high use is people find a citation to it from another database like Psych Abstracts. Oh, I'm going to go get this article and they go to find the dissertation abstracts and we know they're finding it because it's the second most used title and then they look at it and it's just an abstract. So I hate to see that as high as it is. Number one is Mental Measurements Yearbook because of all those psych assignments where they have to find tests. Again, it's available online, but people still like to use the books. If I take out the Hot Topics books, then numbers 9 through 12 would be these. Um, the one that I think is the oddball is the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. I don't know why that is as high as it is. I don't, wouldn't expect that to be on there. And you can see if we go down the list to number 18, Britannica, after 200 and some years, is still one of the top reference books that's being used in my collection. So it's still, it's still valuable. But today's reference collections are, have evolved, and we're at this turning point. And I think you're on this webinar today because you're at that turning point. We have a lot of books, but people aren't using them. And when we really think about it, 
we built the collection for the reference librarians, not for the users. They're, they're, we buy books because we think we might use them to help somebody answer a question, not because the users are, are grabbing it. Now, in my case, the Hot Topics books, we just buy those series. We get them in online, and we still are getting them in print, too, cause, because use is high. And so those, we don't select which topic. We just get the whole series. That's really built for the users. Uh, we have some ebooks, and there are, you know, a number of ebooks that are available. And we'll talk. I'll talk a little bit more about ebooks in a minute. But again, there's not much use of the ebooks either when you really look at those, the sets that, at least in my case. By the way, all the data that was in that previous thing was all based on the print collection. There's tremendous competition from the web, because people go to the web first. And that includes Wikipedia. And Wikipedia has become, in its short history, the most consulted encyclopedia on the planet. And despite the fact that I would like to not be able to say this, it is also the most reliable encyclopedia on the planet. Most of the information in the Wikipedia is correct. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a old book guy, and I'd like to say, oh, Britannica is way better. Well, Britannica is better in many ways. But if you want something fast and quick and short factual information, I go to Wikipedia first. There's easy access from outside. And reference collections, reference materials have lost that royal status that they had even 20 years ago. And I think we've seen the deposition of reference as be from being the kings and queens of the collection. And it's now time to take some action about that. Now I want to look and see what other questions we have. So if I could get back to the questions on my computer and see if we have, see what we have. And I'm going to go back to the first. I wish I could make this bigger, by the way. All I'm seeing is a little tiny line. Um, okay, poll doesn't, I'm going, I'm going to get past the poll. Okay, voted, people who voted for increase because I did not specify print. Yes, that is correct. And they include the online tools and that's getting a lot of use. Um, so that's one reason that use would go up if you have a lot of ebooks and people are using them, which is not the case in my library. That would be a good reason for it to go up. So I collect my, co so I reduced my collection down to under 500. No, uh, that's I'm going to talk about that in the next section. So I'm going to. Many reference books are used through mediation with a reference librarian. That is, in fact how we librarians use them. We guide our users to those books. We have some librarians who are tied to the computer and don't really know the great reference sources. Same thing is true here. We have some librarians. I've always been a book person. The, probably the best example of that is the law, the legal reference collection. If you have those law reporters, US reports, federal reporter, federal supplement, your state reporters, we used to have all those paper, and then we had Westlaw and Lexis. So we have three options. I'm not a big Lexis fan as much for legal, but I love Westlaw. Um, and when we added Westlaw, to my great personal dismay, and I actually have a picture of me in the stacks, sort of you know, them prying my cold, dead fingers off the last uh, reporter, we discarded the federal reporter, the state reporters, everything except the US reporter. And the reason for that is it's available online in two different acknowledged sources. While if someone asked me for a case, I would tend to walk to the shelf. The reality is most people don't need to ask because they're finding it online. And so um, the online became has become the standard in the legal research for us, as it probably has for many of you. Isn't that part of our job, to lead users to the items that, in our professional opinion, will be the most useful? Exactly. And very well stated as well. Yes, that is our job, lead people to the resources. But at the reference desk, which I still, even though I'm associate dean, I still work at reference on a regular basis. 
first thing I do is, is look online. And 90 plus percent of the time, I find the resource there. So I'm, even I am not using the books like we used to. But yes, our job is to guide people to the appropriate source. And if that's a book, great. But most of the time, it isn't in my experience. Can you please give us some ideas of things you feel should be counted as reference statistics? I'm going to skip that, not because I don't want to answer it, but because I, that will eat up the rest of the time. And I'm, I think that's the subject of a, new, of a different uh, webinar. Is there any literature or guideline available to address the, the relationship between print and electronic? Holding, oh, holdings and reference when you're trying to weed. Um, not that I'm aware of. There are some guidelines that RUSA has put together about electronic resources that might be useful. What is your rationale for keeping opposing viewpoints in reference? Good question. That's from Laura. And we circulate ours. And I'll, I'm going to answer that in the next section. So I'm not going to answer it right here. I suppose how you discuss how libraries can compete with the web. Well, I wish I had a good, good answer to that one, Tom. Um, it's not the web is what people are going to use first. And I think we just need to acknowledge that. It, shoot, when I'm a reference librarian, it's what I use first. Uh, so we need to find a ways to incorporate that into how we help people. But I don't think we can compete with it. Have you used paratext reference universes? That's a really good resource that can help get people to the stuff that's in your collection. And I think I'll mention that in a moment. We are, increase, we are facing increasing pressure to give up collections space um, for user space. Yes, that is, we are giving up collection space for user space. Let me move on to the next sec segment here. So what can you do about all this? I'm going to give you five ideas. First, figure out what is being used in your collection, like just like we do. Um, and, you know, I don't, the, the last thing on here, if I can, by whom, I don't really know who is using my collection. But here's a picture of Bonnie, one of our circulation staff, literally counting use of reference resources. All she has to do is wave it over that pad. You'll see the Encyclopedia of Serial Killers, a book that always makes me nervous when it reaches the high use end. Uh, and then she's got an Alzheimer's disease. These are actual books that we got picked up that were laying around, and she's counting the use. Very simple, but it gives us good data on to what is used. And this is the a copy of the spreadsheet that I used, and I can play with this. This is sorted by the high use. You see mental measurements at the top. World Book is down there, and Britannica is farther down. Um, what my number one recommendation is if people aren't using the books in the building, let them take them out of the building. This divide between non-circulating reference and circulating rest of the collection is ended. We, we've been circulating our reference books for a couple of years. Now, part of that is because of the building project. Things were less accessible, so it gave me an in to get the staff to buy into circulating the books. But let people check out your reference books. If they're not using them in the building, let the one person who wants to use it take it home for a while. Right now, our, our CERC policy is a three-day loan, and you can renew it once for three more days. I'm working on making it a, just a seven-day loan, which makes more sense since many of our students are commuters and are only on campus once a week, so it would be easier for them. That actually works out for them now because there's a day grace period before any fines kick in, but it'd be just easier. But let people have things. Um, provide scanning. That's something we did this year. Uh, oh, by the way, of the use of our collection, it's almost exactly 50-50 from people checking them out of the building or using them in the building. And that kind of surprised me. But the checkout is as high as use in the building. Um, and then move things out. Put them somewhere else where they'll be more accessible. And here's a picture of a guy. This is staged, I confess. That's one of our CERC staff. But these are books that have been returned that were reference books. So he's looking like he's checking them out. And they're all books on something to do with higher education that were in reference. But they really were checked out. Um, promote your reference collections. Uh, 
public libraries are good at this, and I know we have a lot of public librarians here today that are used to doing displays and stuff, but we could do that at the university level, too. This Here's a little display I did about base, this baseball season. So I pulled some reference books on baseball, put them up, and if somebody sees this, they could grab that Encyclopedia of Negro League and check it out and take it home with them. And when people see things this way, it, it lets them know that they're there and it gets them uh, used, in which case you can justify buying the new edition someday. Um, most important, I think we all need to do this, change our purchasing habits. The, this, in fact, for my Iowa State friends there, Eleanor Matthews and I, Ellie and I wrote an article on this in the 1980s about weeding reference, and this, these things still apply, and even more so today. Order selectively. We, we get in the habit as librarians of, we need, this, we need the new edition of this book every year. Well, you know what? We probably don't. And um, an example of that is this picture. The Britannica, again, picking on Britannica, they're not the only one. They put out a yearbook. So there's the Britannica Book of the Year. And ours go back to 1913. And on the next shelf are the new We have every year for, for the 20th century. And nobody's using these things. And what they are is a summary of world events. Well, in today's publishing world, we don't really need a summary of world events every year because that's available very easily everywhere. So I should probably cancel that standing order. And standing orders eat into our budgets. There are many things that we could buy every five years, every 10 years, every three years. Don't need to buy it every year. So the first thing that I recommend, which will save your library some money, and in this era that's critical, and make your collection more user-friendly is get rid of your standing orders and buy things irregularly. And then eliminate these add-ons, like the book of the year. A lot of reference books, there are supplements. Gale is particularly egregious, or used to be anyways, in this, that you'd buy the Encyclopedia of Associations, and then there were these quarterly supplements to keep it up to date. We don't need that stuff anymore. We have other sources to keep things up to date. Uh, and then promote your, e your electronic sources. Most of us have ebook reference sources. And most of us, well, OK, I won't say most of us, me, I am very disappointed in those. Not because they're not good sources, but because they don't get used. Well, why don't they get used? They don't get used because the free open web is easily accessible to our users. The ebook reference materials have to have some authentication to show that a user actually has access, legal access, to get into it. So those Oxford and Gale things that we have don't get a lot of use because it, you have to go through so many steps to get into the source to use them. There are some things we can do, though. We could add records to the catalog. So this is my catalog. And these are not necessarily reference sources, but we have records in our catalog for every ebook that we have. And people can find them when they're looking for books on a subject or a title. And they can link in. Uh, you can see connect to this resource available online. Pe it gets people into those sources. Now they still, if they're off campus, still have to authenticate, log in, which discourages people. So the use of those will never be as high. I understand the publisher side. The publisher cannot just say, here's the free Encyclopedia Britannica. Britannica actually tried that, and it didn't work because they couldn't stay in business. So there's got to be a trade-off between access to the e-books, making that as easy as possible without giving away access and shortchanging our vendors. Um, I chose the St. Louis County Library um, has uh, does a nice job of promoting its electronic resources. And then here, it's not just the e-books. They also have audio books. And now you're not going to listen to a reference book, I don't think, unless you're in the Red-Headed League and you want to hear the Britannica A to Z. Uh, not, not my cup of tea, even as a reference librarian. But you know, we can, it, the more we can promote access to these things, the more they're going to get used. 
what's going to happen next is I really hope to see reference collections get smaller. And in fact, some libraries have just eliminated the reference collections. We haven't gone that far. Ours all circulate. There are 17 titles in my collection that do not circulate, that we hold for ready reference. 17 out of 31, well, of 11,000 titles, 17 we keep in the building because people still use them and we want access. And actually, in my opinion, I could probably cut that number down in half. But everything else, people can check out. So, and I encourage you, make your reference collection circulating. Let people use them. Determine a, a loan period that's appropriate. Maybe it's not the same loan period as your other books, but at least when people can check them out, they're very grateful for that. We have so many students who are so grateful working on that paper, want something, oh, here's an encyclopedia that has an article, and you can check it out. That accounts for the fact that half of our use is checkouts. But some libraries, and these all tend to be smaller libraries. I have a list here of some uh, Grand Prairie, Prairie Public Library in Illinois, Lafayette Public Library in Colorado, Claremont County Public Library, Ohio, Baltimore County Public Library, which is actually a quite large one, uh, Thomas in Maryland, Fort, Thomas Ford Memorial Library, Illinois, Seneca College in Ontario, the California Ontario, not the Canadian Ontario. Well, actually, no, I, that is Ontario, Canada. I'm sorry for all my our Canadian friends here. Middlesex Community College in Connecticut. Every one of those libraries is, has taken their reference collection and just gotten rid of it and integrated it into the main collection. That has a real advantage. People browsing the main collection will also find the reference sources. So if I'm looking for books on baseball, I can find the baseball encyclopedia next to a biography of Hank Aaron, next to a book about rules and a photo book on great plays. It, it's a great way to further promote reference things, but it makes reference books become regular books. And that's what I'm mentioning here is that we want to, if you want to promote the reference sources, get people to use them. I do believe some genres of reference books will disappear entirely. Directories have lived past their day. The Encyclopedia of Associations, which was one of you know the top 10 books in my era of becoming a reference librarian, I have not touched in years. Because every time I look up an association, I just go to their web page. I don't need a book to tell me about it. Same thing with biographies. The who's who's, when I say collective biographies, individual biographies, the biography of Hank Aaron, the biography of Neil Armstrong, the biography of Barack Obama, those things are going to be used forever. But collections uh, like who's who, we really don't need anymore because you can find information about important people through the web. Uh, Wikipedia actually has lots of people in it, and the information is mostly accurate. So I, I see those kind of things just disappearing. Um, and there are probably you could probably think of others, but reference service. This is this is my Rusa point here. Reference service is still going to continue. The person who asked the question about isn't it our job to guide people to the resources? That's absolutely correct. It's just that the resources that we're going to use are going to be different. Now a little bit more on Wikipedia because it always comes up. Wikipedia is a very good thing for current information because Wikipedia has the ability to ad adopt and evolve. When, there's, when Kyrgyzstan has a rev revolution, that's in Wikipedia the next day. It's not going to be in Britannica for quite a while. So it's great for current stuff. And if you're looking up what's happening now, there's really no other place to go. It's not so great for historic long-term things because it doesn't have the editorial control of a traditionally published encyclopedia. So Britannica is better for a history of uh, World War II than Wikipedia is. On the other hand, I can get to Wikipedia from anywhere. I, I could be uh, in the middle of the desert, and if I have a wireless, I could through my phone, if, I have a, if there's a cell phone tower, I can read Wikipedia. Whereas I have to go to the library for Britannica, or I have to go log into Britannica online. I think what's going to happen is that things like Wikipedia and whatever comes next, because you know there'll be a next 
coming along, are always going to be the, f the source of first choice for quick, short information and for current information. Published reference books that are in our collections, those 31,000 items that are in my collection, are going to be the source for the quality information. And so what we need to do as reference is buy and promote the use of quality edited compiled research versus trying to keep up with a quick fact. Uh, we don't even subscribe to facts on file anymore. And I wrote about that in the mid-90s because we canceled it at least five years ago, probably I think more than that. No. We went longer ten years ago now. We, we don't get facts on file because those facts are available. And the world has other ways to get to it. But we do keep the Britannica because its analysis and its editorial control keeps, uh, is more eternal. And so I think what you're going to see is that reference books become regular books. And what we still do, though, is guide people to quality information. And that, that's the job of the reference librarian. So let me go back for questions, because we're also at the end of our time. And I see there are some more questions, but let me see what we have. Ah, let me, OK. What are the 17 that don't circulate? If you go to the book list, book list online website, there's a reference blog, and I posted the titles on there in February. So if you want to see what my 17 books are that don't circulate, there it is. Do you indicate in the OPAC when you put an item on display? Yes, we do. It says first floor reference display, so people know that it's not in the regular shelf. And that's very easy for us to go in and out. Right now, we had a display last uh, last month on Cesar Chavez, because it was Cesar Chavez Day in California in March. Those are still there, as far as I know, because Julie in reference hasn't had time yet to take them out. But when she does, she'll change the display. Um, I'm, in terms of writing collection development policies, do you have any comments on defining the re reference collection as print or print plus electronic? I think you have to define it as print plus electronic. In fact. I would recommend don't define it as either one. It's the sources that you use to help your community find information. And so ideally, you could buy print, you could buy electronic, you could buy microfilm, God forbid. You could buy audio books if that was appropriate. I'd rather not define a format, but define the function. OK. There are other questions. And I got back to the last one. So aren't some reference titles simply too expensive to circulate? Risk of them disappearing. Good question. And that is one that we've debated. There are some of our reference staff still are not comfortable about circulating our reference books. And in fact, bring up a great, a great concern Suppose somebody checks out volume with the P's out of the Oxford English Dictionary and loses it. Are we going to charge them to replace the dictionary since we can't buy just the P volume out of Oxford English Dictionary? And that's a real dilemma because, you know, am I going to charge them $1,500 for losing one book? The re and the reality is it has never happened that somebody's lost one volume out of a multi-volume set or they've lost a very expensive reference book. I think our users appreciate it and have so far, knock on wood here, everything that has been checked out has in fact been returned, except for a couple of the really inexpensive Hot Topics books, which are easy to replace. Uh, we've never lost an expensive book. One of the reasons reference books were non-circulating is because they were expensive and very difficult to replace. It's something you might want to do. If you have materials that you're not comfortable with people taking out, then maybe you want to make them non-circulating. The flip side of that, though, is if they're not circulating, they're more likely to be damaged in the building because somebody could rip the pages out that have what they want. So it's a choice you have to make. But yes, reference books disappearing. I got to say, from my experience with my users, my collection in two years, 
we have lost very, very few reference librarians. Uh, reference librarians. Well, we haven't lost any librarians. We've lost very few reference books. If you circulate, what do you do about assignments using particular? We, did, we hit this. Uh, who asked this? Stuart asked, if you circulate reference books, what about assignments that are assigned for a certain one? Well, we hit this last year when there was a French Revolution in, uh, assignment in a history class, and somebody checked out all the encyclopedias on the French Revolution. We didn't know it at the time. If we know in advance, we can do things like make them non-circulating or even put them on reserve for a class. This is going to happen. Um, that's just like the books in the main collection. Um, I mentioned Cesar Chavez in California. He's a real hero to many of our students. And if you're ever looking up anything on Cesar Chavez, odds are it's checked out. Um, that's true of the reference books and the circulating books. Uh, it's something, if you can work with the people making the assignments, you can make arrangements. But unlike, you know, that, that doesn't happen very often. And sadly, you find out when you have the assignment. Do you have stats on loss rate? Our loss rate is almost zero. I'd say out of the 7,000 things that got checked out, there's maybe two that I know of that did not, or excuse me, out of 3,500 that got checked out, 7,000 that were used, two were not returned, and they were both Hot Topics books, and we build the student for those books. I think that authority caveat on Wikipedia is really not as valid as, if you, as it used to be. Oh, sorry, I should, I'm reading it. You can't see it. But the authority caveat in Wikipedia is really not as valid as it used to be. If you look up a subject that you are very well versed in, you will probably find valid information in Wikipedia. In instruction, we have spoken very critically of Wikipedia in the past, but that is not really true at this point. I agree with that. I find Wikipedia to be quite useful. And what Wikipedia is, is a starting point. I had a student, we have a sister city assignment. and. If you ever get that in your library, it's not an easy one. Find pairs of cities, one in the US and one somewhere else, that are sister cities and write about them. Well, first, it's, it's difficult to find a list. And then once you know what they are, it's difficult to find things about the cities. This student I was helping one day had a sister city somewhere in the US and somewhere in Mexico. And it was a historic Mexican city, which is not very big now, but has big history. Well, I wasn't finding anything. So finally, and he said he has to use books. He wouldn't be allowed to use Wikipedia. Finally, I looked it up on Wikipedia and found out that the historic name is different than the current name. And because of Wikipedia, I was able to find then, oh, it look under this other name. And then he found all kinds of things. So Wikipedia really comes through. But it's a starting point. You don't just use Wikipedia. You use Wikipedia to try to, uh, try to get somewhere else. And I'm seeing a message that it's getting time to wrap up. Let me see how many other questions there are. OK, I see five more questions. Do you want me to stop, and we can answer them later, or should I go ahead and answer? And I'm looking at my, what my the staff here are saying. Stop. OK, it's time to stop. I apologize for going over, but I hope this was useful for you. And we'll answer all the questions offline. Dave, can you hear me? Yes, I can. OK, good. Um, thank you so much um, for the presentation. Um, here's some information about Dave, um, if you want to get a hold of him privately. Um, he told me this earlier today that he would be answering reference questions while he was doing the presentation. But I think um, maybe that didn't happen. So. He will answer your questions um, offline, and they will be recorded, and everybody will receive it. Alexis is really interested in providing other webinars or other kinds of training for you. This is a picture of the Alex web page, and um, shows you the upcoming webinars that the uh, Alex is doing. If you have a suggestion for a webinar, there's a place on this web page where you can suggest a topic. 
Or you can also send a, um, a suggestion to Pamela Blue, who's in charge of the Continuing Education Committee of ELEX. Um, we really thank you for your time today, and I hope you enjoyed or learned something more about reference collections. Thank you very much.